morning, everyone. Um, I'm uh, Martin Hughes. I'm an associate at Hempson's. Um, I work in the healthcare litigation um, department, which is uh, effectively uh, the defence of clinical negligence claims brought by patients uh, and on behalf of estates um, against various NHS trusts across the Northwest, but also for uh, private uh, clinicians acting in their private capacity, uh, GPs, and so on. Um, my colleague uh, Chris Alton is a partner uh, in the in the same department. Um, can I have the next uh, next slide, please? Um, so the agenda for today, I think I'll probably be talking maybe for about twenty minutes, twenty five minutes, um, and and then I'll hand over to Chris, um, who will be dealing with uh, effectively as you see on the agenda from disclosure onwards. It's only one actual area, but it's there's quite a it's quite a big area of disclosure, uh, it covers data protection and so on. So what I'll be covering is uh, the kind of basics, the principles. It, it might be um, that you know a lot of this already, but it's just kind of the background. It's always good to, to refresh oneself. Um, so we'll be looking at um, record keeping in terms of uh, a patient's medical records, um, why they're important, uh, what amounts to a record, what types of records are there, and some some kind of guidance and tips on preparation. Uh, we'll also be looking at how if you find yourself unlucky enough to be in a courtroom, uh, how judges interpret the medical records, what they're looking for, uh, what they will consider when making a decision on a, on a, on a particular factual issue. Um, and I'll also be touching on um, reflective practice uh, as to whether that would amount to a record also. Um, at the end, hopefully we'll have about five or ten minutes for questions. Um, can I have the next slide, please? Um, so first of all, what are medical records and why are they important? So um, th this definition is taken from the British Medical Journal. So they're a fundamental part of a doctor's duties in providing patient care, uh, and they are a permanent account of the care a patient has received. Um, so so can I have the, uh, the next, uh, next slide, please? Um, so why are they important? So medical records, what, 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 what's important? So you're looking for an accurate, uh, clear and concise record um, for a number of reasons. And the first point is um, from a healthcare professional um, uh, perspective, as opposed to a legal perspective, um, it, it facilitates effective communication. Um, between the various healthcare professionals, obviously, in a, particularly in a hospital setting, you might have different clinicians seeing the patient throughout the day, seeing patients uh, at different times on you know, change of shifts and so on. So it allows for that continuity of care. So one clinician can take over from the next, look back at the records, um, see what's been going on um, and continue their management. So it allows the, the next clinician to take over seamlessly. Um, so they can you know, read your records, quickly pick up where you have left off and, and just makes the whole process more efficient. Um, it ensures the patient's assessed needs continue to be met comprehensively, so continuity of care. Um, the issue we will be looking at really is the bottom one. So the, in terms of the, how effective they are as potential evidence um, of the standard of care, the, the, the treatment that's been provided to the patient and something that you, in a rare circumstance, you, you know, you probably do hundreds and hundreds of pages of records a week. You know, there will, there will be that one record maybe in a career, in a decade, that is scrutinized at an inquest or at trial. So that's the, that's the thing we will be focusing on. Um, how effective is your record as evidence? Um, a good robust note taken at the time is something that you can rely on. As I say, if you find yourself in a witness box uh, at a trial. Um, so what is a health record? Um, not as easy as it potentially sounds that, um, you know, we might think, what are the obvious records? Uh, sorry, sorry, Chris, grab the uh, next slide, please. Um, and I'll come on in a moment to give you some examples. But um, the Data Protection Act 2018 is the most up to date definition we have of what a health record is. So it's effectively data concerning health uh, made by a health professional in connection with the diagnosis, 
care or treatment of an individual to whom that data relates uh, and that can be personal data relating to either the physical or the mental health of an individual uh, including provision of healthcare services uh, which reveals information about his or her health status um, quite a broad definition um, so some examples um, as I say some of these are a little bit more obvious um, so in a, we have you know the handwritten and typed records a GP setting what we would call the Lord George cards and historically that uh, those entries um, clinical records uh, operation notes nursing records physiotherapy occupational therapy and so on um, we um, will be looking in a bit more detail shortly about kind of more modern types of records in terms of uh, instant messaging and so on um, but, but correspond you know kind of more old-fashioned correspondence in terms of um, letters to GPs um, other clinicians and with the patient um, emails um, obviously a, a more more recently we we find we're, we're sending more emails to other clinicians and and patients um, admission records um, investigation results laboratory results biochemistry you know the, the list goes goes on and on um, photographs uh, and videos would also be um, a, a part of that they would be classed as records as well as our printouts from any kind of recording system I'm thinking more than kind of you know, maternity um, care with with traces and so on um, and ECGs that they, they all come under the ambit of records um, so some kind of more slightly more gray areas um, so we've seen this more in the covid world with with social distancing and patients being seen remotely so video and audio recordings um would they be classed as a record i'll be coming on to this in a bit more detail shortly but but clearly they are um mdt records so multidisciplinary team you, know, you might have for example a colorectal mdt where you'll have radiologists surgeons oncologists and so on you might have um, a cohort of 30 40 patients um, that you're going through one by one and you're discussing each individual case uh, and then a case plan and then a, a management plan is agreed would that be a record um, yes it probably would um, slightly grayer area um, text messages emails whatsapp messages with colleagues again in, in kind of in the more more, more in the kind of more recent past um, these have started to creep in with people using whatsapp groups and so on um, so I'm going to come on to that shortly. Um, I, as I mentioned, personal records, reflective practice notes, personal audits, I would suggest those are probably not patient records provided they're done properly, um, which again I'll, I'll come on to in a bit more detail shortly. Um, so WhatsApp um, or any other social media platform that as either available now or in May arrive next year or the year after or so on. obviously these things are developing and being developed quite quickly um, so the record management code of practice 2021 deals with instant messaging apps on platforms and what they suggest is they shouldn't be used as the main or primary record for a person um, and where possible information shared in that way needs to have a place in the health or care record of that person and that can be a printout of the whatsapp exchange um, with the contents transcribed into the record. So effectively what you're looking at is to get the content of that discussion onto, onto the patient's records um, or a progress note accurately covering the exchange entered into the record. Um, if the application or the platform is the only place that information is stored, then the guidance is that it should be managed in line with the rest of the code of practice. So effectively as a, as a part of the patient's records. Um, next slide please so preparing the record um as i say most of you will do this day in day out um but it's always good to um kind of go back to basics and reflect on what the recommendations and advice is so the gmc good practice um, guide is that you should include all your relevant clinical findings um decisions that were made on management the action agreed um it's good to say who was making those decisions. Um, I know we see quite frequently if a, we have a consultant ward round, we might have a junior doctor who's actually handwriting the record. It's always good to say 
um, who was making that decision, um, inf any information given to the patient, any drugs prescribed or other investigations or treatments. Um, the last line is, it can be a bit tricky that you, obviously the date is usually included in the record and if it's um, an electronic record it will usually include the time but sometimes we see a record with a day but without a time uh, it's always good to put the time it just makes life easier if as I say if we find ourselves in the courtroom and we're retrospectively trying to work out what was happening and when um, documents you make including the clinical records to formally record your work must be clear accurate and legible um, you should make records at the same time as the events you are recording or as soon as possible afterwards. Um, now, a fair bit of clinical judgment comes into that in terms of um, what you include and when you do it. I dealt with a case a couple of years ago involving one of the trusts in the Northwest where the records, it was impossible to have done them at the time because clinicians were in a life or death um, situation trying to resuscitate a patient in that situation perfectly acceptable for the records to be written up later but what you should always do is state the records are being written in retrospect and state why they're being done in retrospect and try to give an accurate time of when the management was being provided um, as I say just so if someone's looking back later you can find out what was going on and when um, there's an old line we tend to use in medical legal practice to say if it's not being documented it hasn't been done that's probably a little bit unfair because you can't be expected to write absolutely everything down um, again, it comes down to clinical judgments as to what you think is important, what you think needs to be in there. Um, what we see in a medical legal perspective um, is uh, particularly in claims against uh, nursing staff where patients have developed pressure sores. Um, we, we often see where you know, the patient may be having regular rolling and in skin integrity checks and so on, but they're not always documented. Um, and the way the court will approach that is if it's not being documented, you're, you're, on, you're on an uphill task to uh, persuade a court that those those checks were done and that was done. So, as I say, try to document what you've done, but, you know, within the limits of what is possible. Um, you know, you've not got an infinite amount of time, pressures of seeing other patients and providing care. The record keeping, possibly, possibly quite rightly, comes a, a little bit further down the scale of uh, what's the most important thing to be doing in terms of managing your time um so as i say uh, written records should be clear accurate and legible um next slide please um so really when when do you start to do the record um as i say usually if you can, it's better to do them contemporaneously at the time, but it's not always practical to prepare the record immediately. Uh, ideally, you should be documenting them as soon as possible while the events are fresh in your mind, as that also reduces the chances of a mistake being made or something important being omitted. So, you know, you might see a patient if you don't write the record up until the next day or later on that day, you, know, you, you might forget something important that was said. So obviously, the earlier, the better. Um, it's also important, particularly if uh, it's a patient who's going to be seen by another clinician shortly afterwards as, as I mentioned earlier continuity of care allows them to pick the records up know what's been going on and, and just keep things moving um, so when do you start to do the record um, sometimes you may do it before the patient is seen um, if you are reviewing the records um, previously then the in certain situations, it might be fair to start making a record before you even speak to the patient. And an example of that, this was a GP case, J.A.H. Byrne and others, where the uh, High Court reviewed this um, particular case where a um, patient had a left arm and left leg ischemia uh, from a thromboembolus, which, was, which ultimately resulted in amputation of both. Uh, but one of the issues in that case was that this was not a new disease, this was a chronic ongoing disease and the GP in that case um, part of the process of doing the record was to review the previous records uh, to see how this particular disease had been progressing um, so in certain situations it might be fair and reasonable to look back at the records and start to make your record before before you see uh, before you even start to speak to the patient uh, but it's quite case specific and probably in the majority of times you wouldn't be doing that but it can the, the record can start before before you even see them. Um, 
Can I have the next slide, please, Chris? Um, um, so, so just to finish up on that last point, there was a again a phrase we use in, in medical legal in the medical legal world when it comes to drafting witness statements, where we say don't let the sun set on a witness statement. So try and get it drafted before the end of the day. And it's probably it's probably a fair comment for medical records as well. Um, in terms of what to include in the records, um, I say some of this is taken from kind of GMC, uh, British Medical Journal advices to the process you go and you'd probably be quite familiar with this. So, so obviously the first one of the first things you'll see on a, on a record, maybe the history taking, the presentation, uh, you know, you may be asking the patient both open and closed questions in terms of what the uh, what the disease or the, the illness is that they've got. Um, that will depend on the presentation that will depend on clinical judgment uh, as to what questions you ask and what you include. Um, I will come on to this in a little bit more detail later, but one of the real issues we have in medical legal practice, and there's no right or wrong answer, is do you record negative findings? So if you ask a patient, for example, in a cord or equina case, you know, do you have any um, saddle anesthesia? Do you have any um, bilateral low limb symptoms, do you have any change in bowel or bladder habit? If the patient say no, 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 no to all those, do you write that down? Um, and we have seen this in uh, come before the court. Uh, I've had cases in the past where clinicians have said, well, I would never record a negative finding. I would have asked those questions, but the fact I've not, I've not recorded it means that the, the, the response must have, been an, must have been a no, must have been a negative finding. Um, so there's no real right or wrong answer, but the courts have said in case of Shaw and Stead is an example. Um, and in this case, the reference used was that the patient described having Bambi, um, as in the Disney film Bambi, Bambi legs um, and urinary incontinence. Um, but that hadn't been documented. The record was completely silent. Um, and in that case, the claimant, the claimant actually succeeded. Um, so in terms of the examination, um, something that is entirely normal can be just as important as a finding of abnormal in some circumstances and in some cases. It's not to say if you don't document it, you can't successfully defend your case. You you can. It just it just makes it a little bit more difficult. And then you're relying on your standard practice to say, you know, my standard practice is not to record negative findings on an examination. Um, ambiguity is another issue. Um, so again, just just be careful because, for example. Give it, I'm using this cord requiner case as a as a kind of case example at the moment. Um, sometimes ambiguity um, can can creep in, so always make sure, especially if it's something like anaesthesia, is it bilateral, is it unilateral, um, and just be be quite clear on exactly where the patient is is reporting loss of sensation for that particular case. Um, next slide, please. Uh, investigation results. Um, I've seen investigation results. They can, you know, they can run on for page after page after page. You're not going to be expected to record all of them, but anything that is particularly key. So if you have, you know, abnormal blood gases, or if you have something that's shown up on the blood that's abnormal, um, you might want to just very briefly document that you've seen it. You've seen the radiology findings um, and what jumps out as being abnormal. Um, and then finally, you moving then towards diagnosis. So that can include differentials. I've been in court when clinicians have been criticised where they've made a diagnosis, which was probably the right diagnosis, which was probably perfectly reasonable um, to make. But the, the fact they've not included other differentials, um, which may have led to other investigations, has not resulted in criticism, but, but kind of weakened their position a bit. So if there, if there are other differentials, even slightly less likely, um, it's always a good idea to uh, to document them. Um, just so you you know what, what can be excluded later. Um, was anyone else involved? I'd say this is probably aimed more at the junior doctors who may be doing ward rounds with consultants who you know may be acting essentially as a scribe. So um obviously what discussions were had who was so obviously they, they as i mentioned earlier they should be writing who they're with that they're on a ward round with consultant x um but obviously when they're acting in their own capacity as a junior doctor so if they're doing their own examinations their own assessments 
uh, especially if it's a, something they're unsure about, they think actually I could do with a discussion with my consultants or my supervisor about that, and they they go off to have that discussion. Um, obviously, that that is important. That should go in the records. You know, discussed with X, who agrees the case plan, something like that, that kind of thing. But, you know, anything in particular that was said, anything that was suggested in terms of any any further uh, investigations or any other considerations. Um, Next slide, please. So uh, staying with what to include in the records, uh, once you've got your diagnosis and your all your differentials and, and you've got a, uh, you've made a decision as to how this patient is to be managed, um, you'll want to include what your management and treatment is, uh, include within that informed consent. Now, you may have a separate consent form for any particular invest, any specific investigations or anything um in terms of surgery and that kind of thing you're going to have consent forms and so on uh, but you know you may want to involve informed consent something like you know you've discussed it with the patient who agrees with the management um you may want to include you know the material risks and alternatives and so on i'm thinking more there of seeing somebody in the outpatient if particularly you've seen perhaps somebody in an outpatient um and you you know you say suggesting, suggesting to them you know, we can do these investigations, you can do these tests, or we can send you for this treatment. And you know, if, if there's a, a kind of a, a spectrum of options open to them, uh, you might want to note that, Dan, that you, you've explained that to them and you've put the the options to them, the, the pros and cons of each, of each, the risks and the alternatives. Um, so, preferences as well if a patient has a particular preference or a particular uh, wish or there's something they say look I'm absolutely against having xyz um you know doc document that perfectly reasonable to document that um and then treatment so obviously any any prescription drugs any procedures um any any treatment that's been arranged is uh, should go in in the record as well um, and then finally, referral. You, so you may see a patient, you think this is outside my area of expertise. He needs to be seen by somebody uh, in another area. Uh, obviously, if you, if you make the referral, that, that's something you would you would make clear. Um, next slide, please. Um, so safety netting and follow up. Um, in, again, coming back to the, kind of coming back to the cold requirement point. A case I saw where patients had been sent home and there was a question mark about safety netting you know were they told what the red flags were to come back you know if, if you develop xyz you know, go to any come back so on if you give any safety netting advice or any follow-up advice um for example you may again in the gp setting then you know you may do a blood test and say well you know you need to come back in six weeks or six months or three months or anything like that um you would you know you would document um i've touched on this briefly already so date and author are essential but time is also helpful um it, abbreviations and shorthand um ideally avoid that but given time is often precious um we see we do see shorthand and it's perfectly acceptable provided it's kind of objective objectively understood shorthand so you know, another clinician would come along and understand exactly what you meant um because of, um, the problem with ambiguity is it can cause not just confusion but misinterpretation and from a medical legal perspective it's something we see quite frequently um in in litigation um so what not to include um hopefully hopefully you won't do this but again it's always good to just remind people so anything of professional or derogatory or even libelous um the way a clinician i went to a training session quite some time ago and the way a clinician put this to me is when you're doing your record think about this if that was read out to you by a coroner or by a judge in court would you feel uncomfortable and if you would then you probably shouldn't be writing it so that's, that's probably the best way to think about that um next slide please um so just um to kind of draw this to a bit of a conclusion so take care legibility take a little extra time and care to write legibly so others can read it later both other clinicians and as i say we found ourselves in, a, in an inquest or a court so those records can be read and understood 
um, integrity. So avoid offensive and unhel unhelpful comments, um, things that might be humorous. Not only can undermine the patient relationship, but can damage professional credibility. Um, and, can, and could be potentially embarrassing if, if in, in court or an inquest. Um, and proofreading. So if you've got the time, you know, 30, the way one of my colleagues wants to put this to me, it's better to spend 20 or 30 seconds reading over your note now rather than spending three years in litigation um, wishing you had it done if, you know, if something in that record had been omitted or if something in that record hadn't been made clear. Um, next slide please so video recordings um these really should be treated the same way as any other medical record uh, especially in terms of disclosure and data security there's quite a helpful gmc guide online about this as to how the record should be prepared what the patient should be told before you start the recording and by recording i mean both audio and and video um when i initially did these slides about a year ago um we were in a slightly different COVID-19 world so I did make this comment at the bottom we may see more of this in a post-COVID-19 world I think things have probably moved on a little bit since then um obviously the, the opening up more and more to in-person consultations um so the recordings and the videos may may drop off a little bit um, but as I say, we, we may see more of this now. Um, a lot of patients are quite comfortable having, um, and it's probably, you know, in certain circumstances, it may be more convenient for them to have a, an outpatient appointment done on, a, on, a, on an online platform rather than actually coming to see you face to face. So we, we may see more of that. But if, if you are interested, it's uh, there's quite a helpful GMC guide online as to how you should be, uh, you should be dealing with, with videos and recordings. Um, next slide, please. Um, so what if you do identify an error in your records later? And when I say later, I mean, it could be a week later, it could be a day later, it could be a year later. Um, the first thing to do is um, don't just delete it, don't scribble it out, don't make it completely illegible. Um, and don't try to add anything later um, without making it clear you've done that. So um, I had a case where we were at trial and there was a record which had been done and then in different handwriting another record but the person who added that record hadn't initialed it hadn't dated it and hadn't timed it and it caused a lot of discomfort with the, with the judge as to who added that record and when um, and it was probably entirely innocent um, there's no suggestion whatsoever that there was any anything underhand going on it was probably someone had come along possibly a consultant who had um, reviewed a, a more junior um, clinician's record and added an entry, but the fact they'd not said when that was added, it, it the claimant's legal team just jumped on that as if to say, you know, we don't know when these records are made. It cast out on the entirety of the record. It means none of the record can be relied upon. It means none of the records are um, something you can be comfortable relying on when making your judgment. So if you do have to make changes to the records, um, the best way to do it, and this is again in line with this is the in line with GMC guidance is if it's a handwritten record, cross out the error, the single line so you can still read what's underneath. Um, add the new entry alongside it and then put the date, time and signature. Uh, because ambiguity as to who recorded it and when can cause real difficulty. If, so as I, if you remember something significant later on or something else comes to mind or you think well, actually I should have recorded that and I didn't then you can always go back add the addition but it should be clear when you added it who added it what you know when why and where um, computerized entries are slightly different because you will have an audit trail um, so all entries and deletions usually there'll be an audit trail so that that doesn't cause us as many uh, as many problems for us um, so that that pretty much sums up my um, Actually, sorry, Chris. Do you, sorry, does reflective practice? Sorry, um, doesn't. So I thought I'd finish. No, sorry, reflective practice. I did say I would talk about reflective practice. Um, I've had questions in the past fielded from clinicians about whether a personal record or a reflective practice document, or I mean, I had um, a surgeon who told me he did a 
kind of personal audit of any unusual cases it's kind of kind of as a learning practice which should be should be applauded it's it's exactly what's expected you know continuing professional development reflecting on on the treatment you've done constantly improving the standard of care and so on um but from a medical legal perspective is that a record could you be scrutinized on that in a courtroom could a, a coroner um ask to see it and so on um well strictly speaking it's not a patient record it's a core feature of medical practice and it's an ethical duty um rather than a patient record um so there yeah there are formal reflective writing part of the of your professional duty training and development part of your revalidation and appraisals um and as i mentioned at the start they are to improve patient care address patient safety concerns and they're meant to be a learning tool um next slide please chris um so are they um disclosable and by that i mean can a judge ask you to hand them over can um a coroner well the guidance from the gnc is if it's required by statute or if ordered to do so by a judge or presiding officer of the court they are generally not subject to legal privilege um and for example in a clinical negligence claim it's, the rules are governed by the civil procedural rules and part 31.8 which would limit disclosure to documents which are or have been within the trust control um or and say trust control that's if the trust is the defendant um but it will also include documents they have a right to inspect and take a copy of so if you share those with the trust so if you give them a copy to the legal department then they would become what we call disclosable if you yourself were a defendant so if you were named in the proceedings of the party then again they would potentially be disclosable um claimants could apply for what's called a third party disclosure order um but that's usually quite restricted by the courts and usually only when necessary to dispose fairly the claim or save costs um but i think the takeaway point on this is the issues in your reflective practice the chances are in a reflective note that's probably going to be recorded elsewhere so a lot of the information will probably be in the patient records it may be in a trust investigation it may be in a duty of candor letter um and it's probably going to reflect what your factual evidence is so certainly from a medical legal perspective if you have concerns about the care given which you've included in your reflective practice we probably would want to know about that sooner rather than later um so best tips um next slide so the best tips when you're doing your reflective practice certainly do it um you shouldn't be avoiding it if you think a mistake has been made or if you think something has gone amiss but the best way to, to do it is keep the reflection anonymous. Um, there's no need to name the patient. Uh, you don't even need to use the initials. Um, and you should remove all personal identifiers. Um, but even that may not be enough in very specific cases. So if somebody has a very rare condition or very easily identifiable circumstance or an individual, if there's been media, if there's been media interest, it might be that you can identify the patient just from the facts uh, so just by changing there might not be sufficient so what the but what the information commissioner has said um for data to be anonymized it doesn't itself identify any individual and it's unlikely to allow any individual to be identified through its combination with other data which which comes back to the, the point below so if you have a, a very specific um set of circumstances it may still be identical but that's not necessarily a problem um because you know, you've got to do your reflective practice in certain circumstances um and you know there's a regulatory duty for you to do that um and, and the idea really is this is all about valuable experience and complying with those ethical um those ethical duties capturing your learning outcomes and, and thinking about how you do things differently um that is the end of my section so yeah i'll hand over to chris now thank you uh good morning everybody uh, as a trivial um digression before i move on from this slide i see that three of the pictures have pictures of gavels which we all assume relates to the legal process in the uk the only people that use gavels are auctioneers um you'll never see one in a courtroom um so what i'm going to be talking about is 
once the records have been made, which is what Martin's been um, talking about, this is what happens to them afterwards. And that there's various ways they can be requested. Um, criminal investigations um, happens not infrequently. And um, most of the time, if somebody's a victim of crime, they will normally consent for the records of their treatment to be released to the police force. And it's uh, never a um, particular issue, but you do get um, some cases where the patient hasn't provided um, the information to the police force and uh, they're a, you know, a competent adult patient. They've uh, not given their consent and the police feel that they want to see these records. Um, ultimately, the police can seek an order from the court to require uh, the trust or the record holder to produce the records to the court and the court will then rule on what the police are entitled to see. But for obvious reasons, the police don't like that avenue because uh, it's expensive and it's um, slow. Uh, so more often than not, you the trust the the records holder the gp will be presented with uh requests sometimes coming across as demands from the police saying you know please give us these records or else and you can see some terribly terribly uh impressive looking documents that appear on a skim read to be obliging you to disclose those records but when you read them very carefully they are nothing more than a polite request to, would you consider disclosing these records to us? Um, and if you don't have the patient's consent um, to share that information, that's not to say you can't make the disclosure to the police, but you should only be making that disclosure where the public interest in disclosure to the police outweighs the public interest in preserving confidentiality. And shall we say the police constabulary usually have a very different uh, view on where that balance of public interest lies to where healthcare providers do. So um, beware of the police demanding records that they're not entitled to. If, if the dis failing to disclose the record is genuinely going to prejudice the, inve the investigation or detection of crime, then you will certainly have the power to make that disclosure to the police in the public interest, but um, the police mistake the public interest for what is convenient to me at the moment, which is not the same test. Uh, and if you're a keen student of the current police crime sentencing and courts bill, you might have spotted that there was an attempt to give the police powers to require disclosure. Uh, from anyone, including healthcare professionals. Now, the proposal wasn't quite as draconian as it seemed because it was subject to the qualifier, unless this would be a breach of the GDPR. Um, but it would have added a whole layer of complication, a whole layer of people saying, well, the police have said I'm required to disclose this, but would it be a breach of the GDPR to disclose this? And the answer is it would be a breach of the GDPR to disclose it unless there was a sufficiently strong public interest. So we would have just added a whole layer of confusion to the matter. And fortunately, that uh, proposal has now been withdrawn following lobbying by um, the BMA and the National Data Guardian. Um, if you are satisfied that it's in the public interest that information is disclosed to the police without consent, you do have a lawful gateway and now allowing you to do that under the GDPR, which is paragraph two of schedule two of the 2018 Data Protection Act, if you're uh, a nerd and like to know the references. But it's really important to know that that exemption in paragraph two of schedule two is a gateway. It is not an obligation. You will see documents from the police framing it as an obligation. It isn't an obligation. Uh, the most often uh, encountered situation where records are being sought uh, are clinical negligence claims and um, 
also personal injury claims, although I'll focus on the clinical negligence uh, claims because that is, that is the most difficult area where requests are made. Now, if the patient is dead uh, by a quirk of the legislation, the GDPR doesn't apply, the Data Protection Act doesn't apply, and you go back to the 1990 Access to Health Records Act, which means uh, disclosure can be made to a deceased patient's personal representative and anyone who may have a claim arising out of the patient's death. There are certain saving provisions. You're not allowed to disclose information that the patient didn't want disclosed. Um, but um, in general, you would be looking for either the authority of the personal representative of the deceased, that's the executor or the administrator. It's not the next of kin. Next of kin has no legal standing. It's not a legally defined term. It doesn't really mean anything. If it's somebody who may have a, may have a claim arising out of the patient's death, you may need to do a bit more digging as to the nature of the claim and the nature of the relationship um, the applicant has to the deceased. Um, it, it's very difficult to say in the abstract as to whether somebody would be entitled to see those records. It's very context dependent. Um, the, the main route people will access their health records is with a subject access request under the UK GDPR and Data Protection Act 2018. It will either be by the patient or by um, a third party such as a solicitor that they've authorised to make that request on their behalf. Um, the other avenue, the other route to gaining access to the records is a pre-action disclosure request under the civil procedure rules. Now, pre-action disclosure, which is disclosure before court proceedings have been started, that's only available against a proposed defendant. Um, so if you're somebody where you're just holding relevant records, but the, pay the applicant isn't intending to sue you, uh, they can't use the pre-action disclosure route to compel disclosure for you. I mean, most of the time, and I'll come on to why in a moment, they'll be using the GDPR, but there is a slight difference to what they're entitled to via the different routes. So if access is bought by somebody and they're not proposing to sue you, uh, they can gain access to your records for under the civil procedure rules, but only once proceedings have been issued. They can only get pre-action disclosure if they're intending to sue you. Um, medical records, they're admissible at trial as hearsay evidence, and certainly in the civil courts, um, judges tend to take a dim view on anybody that um, sticks to the formality of the hearsay rules or raises them in any way. Generally, um, the judges take the view, well, you know, we're big enough and ugly enough to know what weight to apply to the various documents. Don't bother me with all the, the uh, complicated law about hearsay. Um, sometimes if there is an issue as to accuracy, it, you might be needing to call the maker of the um, document to prove its accuracy. But often, and especially in the High Court, there's a standard direction that the records will be taken as evidence of what they record without need for further proof unless a party makes a specific objection. Um, the main practical effect of uh, poor record keeping is that it does uh, make it much more likely that a claim is going to be brought against the trust. So there are various cases that um, set out how the courts treat the medical records in Sinclair and East Lanx. Um, what uh, Lord Justice Tomlinson said, uh, however, it's too obvious to need stating that simply because a document is apparently contemporary uh, does not absolve the court of deciding whether it is a reliable record and what weight can be given to it. Some documents are by their nature likely to be reliable and medical records ordinarily fall into that category. Other documents may be less obviously reliable, 
as when written by somebody with an imperfect understanding of the issues under discussion or someone with an axe to grind. So the courts will tend to regard medical records as being accurate, generally unless it's obvious on their face that there's a problem with them, whether they're incomplete uh, or whether they're not contemporaneous. Um, another court decision, the most reliable source for the history of the claimant's treatment is what is contained in the medical records written contemporaneous. Uh, although it must be remembered that errors can always be made, even in records made contemporaneously. What the court went on to say is usually the best, next best source will be the uh, claimant's own recollection. Often healthcare professionals will have no special memory of a particular consultation and can only reconstruct what occurred by reference to notes made and their usual practice. I'll just pause there to say most judges will not expect a clinician to have a specific recollection of a particular interaction. I have to say anecdotally and based on my own experience of being a health recipient of healthcare, it's a very dangerous assumption to assume that the patient's own recollection uh, is going to be useful. I have very little memory of uh, anything that's happened to me as a patient because my brain goes into a sort of fugue state where the doctor's talking to me and I'm nodding and interacting and I get out of the consultation room and I have not the foggiest clue what we've just talked about. Um, Hind and Craze, this was a case where there was a dispute about the accuracy of the medical records uh, and the route the judge took was, in my judgment, a court can and often will take a starting point, but no more than a starting point that a contemporaneous entry made by a medical professional is likely to be correct and accurate record of what was said and done. So, um, in summary, what all, oh, yeah, and there's the next one, um, HTR, uh, the Nottingham University Trust. This was uh, cerebral palsy claim where the birth was in 2004, but the litigation was 17 years after that. And this is not entirely unusual for cerebral palsy claims. They're often not brought uh, until the um, child is um, 10 or 11, because then you get a much more accurate picture of the prognosis and how severe the uh, injury is. Um, trial judge, Mr Justice Cotter, um, noted that the doctor whose evidence was in question was first contacted in 2018, so 14 years later, uh, and what he said was quite understandably she has no independent recollection of seeing the patient during what was, as she described it, a routine clinic assessment in October 2004. As I've already set out, medical records are usually of very considerable importance in clinical negligence cases. However, in this case, they prov provide some, but only some assistance on the central issue of fact. So, um, in summary, um, good records are very helpful in litigation and they're very helpful in avoiding litigation because if you have a contemporaneous note that removes doubt on particular issues, um, that it's very hard for a claimant to avoid that. Uh, the flip side of that is doubt fosters clinical negligence litigation. And in particular, judges do tend to have a degree of sympathy to pay for patients who have had severe injuries. So if you have poor notes, uh, you leave wiggle room, you leave room for a sympathetic judge to make findings for a claimant. So good notes are a really important tool in actually avoiding litigation, because if your notes are good and detailed, then your chances of having to give evidence in a court hearing are reduced, because either it's clear that the facts the claimant would need to establish to win will not be proved, or, oh, you know, Conversely, um, if your notes are good, but the treatment is incorrect, it's very clear to those uh, advising the trust that the case is indefensible at an early stage. And so you won't be troubled further with that. Um, when the notes are bad, it fosters litigation and the judges do tend and I do appreciate that this actually does not follow logically, but judges tend to equate poor notes with poor medical practice. 
um, because you know even if you're the best doctor in the world but you make dreadful notes it's very hard for the judge to appreciate that there was very careful and considered uh, care delivered it, it it looks like slapdash notes create the impression of slapdash treatment even if that's not the case and i know there are many other variables that uh, can cause notes to be summary so um if we're looking at the two main avenues of access to the medical records being the gdpr subject access request uh, and the civil procedure route well subject access requests they're free um they do have limitations so um a claimant is only entitled to access information that is their own personal uh data um there's not an unqualified right of access to the information there are exemptions to the right of subject access um and one of the main exemptions that we come across is uh, access to information that's also information about third parties um, is uh, an exemption that always has to be considered carefully. It's modified in relation to health records uh, because if you're a healthcare practitioner, it's deemed reasonable to disclose information about you that appears in the health records uh, if you've been one of the treating professionals. Um, but if it's information about uh, a non-healthcare professional third party, um, those are usually only disclosable if there's consent or if it's reasonable in all the circumstances to disclose that information. Now, sometimes, and I do sometimes see this um, in disclosure to the trust, where people have been a bit too rigorous in redacting third party data and they're removing information about third parties such as family history that the patient themselves has um, supplied and I've also in the past seen um, notes redacted where the entry is patient attended with blank well the patient knows who they attended with uh, it is perfectly reasonable for them to see the notes confirming that they attended with their husband or their mother or whatever um, there are some situations and in particular if you are a mental health service provider where you will be redacting third party information where family members might be supplying um, information to the treating team that they do not want the patient to know that they have shared uh, likewise um, there will sometimes be information in safeguarding situations that comes from third parties that may be part of a patient's record that you still wouldn't be disclosing um, and if, if you're looking at the risk of harm to a child there is a, a raft of specific exemptions in relation to that court disclosure is more cumbersome it's harder to initiate um, and you can only use it where the civil procedure rules permits it but it is more powerful because your entitlement to information is not just your own personal data. It's documents that the person holding would want to rely upon, documents adversely affecting that party's own case, documents adversely affecting another party's case, and documents supporting another party's case. So it's wider. You're not, you don't have just that link to being personal data. So relevant internal documents, relevant person. Um, policy documents, uh, investigations that aren't focusing on the individual. These are all caught by um, civil procedure disclosure. Uh, the circumstances in which information can be withheld if it's disclosable are much more limited and it's essentially information subject to legal professional privilege or public interest immunity. There will be some circumstances where even if you're satisfied that you are going to be sued uh, and that the information may be relevant to the case, there may be some circumstances where you might still require a court order for disclosure. These are quite rare, but I had it quite recently in a mental health case where the allegation against 
uh, my client was that it negligently allowed another patient to seriously assault the claimant and the claimant solicitors wanted access to this other patient's records and while technically um, that falls within the scope of disclosable documents if you have an objection to disclosure you're required to raise it and without that other patient's consent uh, and that patient was objecting to the disclosure um, we needed to get a court order that we were required to release them to protect the trust against uh, a claim by that other patient. Um, the other advantage of court uh, CPR disclosure is unless and until that material is put in the public domain in a court hearing, uh, up until that point it has much greater protection against collateral use. So for example, in litigation, it, a staff member's disciplinary file may be relevant if that disciplinary issue related to an adverse clinical incident and you wouldn't be disclosing that under uh, the GDPR um, because you have very little control over the information disclosed under the GDPR but it might be much safer to disclose it in civil proceedings because the person receiving it cannot put it to any collateral use such as putting it on the internet for example. Inquests, and I see that we've had some um, queries coming in already about um, inquests. So clinicians can be asked to do overview statements for the coroner. They can be asked to do quite detailed statements for the coroner. And of course, the records are a critical aid in the preparation to that. Almost certainly, um, the coroners will request access to the records and they have a statutory power um, under the Coroners and Justice Act to obtain copies of those records. And it's actually a criminal offence to conceal or destroy a document that you know or believe to be a document that the coroner would wish to be provided with if aware of its existence. So you have a proactive uh, duty to alert the coroner to information that the coroner would want to receive if they knew it existed. Um, so the coroner has a specific power essentially to request anything that interests them uh, subject to you know the sort of civil litigation exemptions of legal professional privilege um, or um, public interest immunity. I noticed that one of the questions asked about what about disclosure to interested parties now Disclosure to interested parties is in the gift of the coroner. We can't do, uh, we can't dictate to the coroner what they can and cannot share with the interested parties. What we can do is if there is particular sensitivity to the information and we think there should be more caution before it's just handed over, we can flag those issues up to uh, the coroner to make sure that they're taken into account. And I would certainly, if there's anything sensitive, I, I would recommend rather than just giving disclosure, but flag up the sensitivity um, to the coroner at the same time as making the disclosure. So, uh, any, uh, sorry, we've uh, uh, overrun slightly, but um, Martin and I will still be here to take questions if people can do have time to uh, uh, stay on. Um, yep. Obviously, if you don't have time, just drop us an email and we can come back to you um, offline. But um, Jess, have had, you been yep, monitoring the questions? We've had a few come through, so we'll start from the beginning. Um, I think this was during uh, Martin's presentation. When you say well recognised abbreviations, should they be documented somewhere? Um, only if they're very unusual. Um, I think mo what, what I was the point I was trying to make of that th there'll be there'll be abbreviations that we will all recognise. Um, so I mean, off the top of my head, a hashtag means you know a fracture that that would be well recognised. Um, you know, N NBM nil by mouth. Um, you know, on a blood test. Um, you, you know. You, you, 
trying to remember the periodic table now i can't remember <laughs> all the different you, you won't have to put the full chemical name down you can use the initials um if you were commenting on what's shown up on blood results or um biochemistry that kind of thing um yeah just something that i think again it's possibly a little bit of clinical judgment to think you know will can a clinician following me and look at these records and look at the look at them and understand what is meant by by that uh, abbreviation by that shorthand um i'm trying to think of some more off the top of my head slr you know the when you, the, the the leg raise when you see an orthopedic surgeon you have your legs lifted up and yeah those I, that's the point i'm trying to make those those type of abbreviations are fine um but if it's Martin, it was it me needs, sorry sorry i should have been a bit clear on that sorry i, th I think they just have to be well recognized abbreviations yeah I, the thing is that uh, we've got an ever-growing um system of abbreviations particularly when yeah. they've been when we're using them uh whilst writing text messages etc so mm. people feel that these are uh quite acceptable in um yeah. medical nurse and uh, written notes and my concern is that we're introducing lots of abbreviations that actually mean one thing to one person and another yes. to another and I, I'm just concerned that um, sometimes when I read notes it'll have PT uh, to have ECG something else another abbreviation another abbreviation and it doesn't actually make up a sentence not that i'm sort of mad on english language but what i'm concerned about is it doesn't actually reflect what's going on with the patient so that's why i was asking whether or not we needed we had to have a standard abbreviation list even if it's not alongside our notes whether or not we've got one within our own department thank you yeah i yeah. mean the risk from abbreviations is that one person um, understands the abbreviation to mean one thing and another person understands it to mean something else. And if you're in that situation, uh, you can often get into trouble very quickly. I, uh, I think it's a moot point as to whether a standard dictionary of abbreviations is a good thing or a bad thing, because the moment you have a standard dictionary of abbreviations, it encourages people to use more of them and for them to think that that's the standard way of communicating. Um, I might, might say it's probably better to discourage all but the, you know, my widespread um, abbreviations, you know, L in a circle, R in a circle um, for left and right. Um, and, you know, there is no harm in making sure that people have a common understanding within the department, but problem is um, you think, right, okay, everybody within this department understands what that acronym means, but then the patient moves to another department or another hospital and the copy records are full of TLAs um, that they understand differently. So um, I think use with care, and I'm afraid, uh, the NHS is very good at three letter acronyms um, and it sometimes as the legal advisor I have to when I'm in a meeting I have to say sorry I'm going to have to ask you to explain these as we're going on because they mean nothing to me. Thank you Chris. Um, next question. Um, question regarding the coroner requesting health records. Can you cover what the right uh, what right the coroner has to request records from healthcare trusts? Apologies if I've missed this. Um, they had to, the president had to leave for a few minutes. Yeah, I think we covered that after the the request and after the yeah. question came up. I think that was then covered subsequently. So yeah, they're, yeah. they're not. That's it. fine. Yeah, coroner has a statutory power. It's part of the raft of amendments that came in following the mid staffs inquiry and its recommendations. Uh, and okay. the point about interested parties that's a decision for the coroner as to what he's going to share so as i say if you can't stop the coroner doing something they want to do and there's nothing more guaranteed to get a coroner's backup is to try and tell them what to do but 
that doesn't mean if there are particular sensitivities, if, for example, the notes contain information that the patient had flagged up, they did not want disclosed to family members. Um, I would definitely recommend highlighting such sensitivities when making the disclosure to the coroner. Thanks, Chris. Um, next question. The new patient safety incident investigation framework will follow HSIB's investigation style in involving the patient and their account of what happened will be incorporated. Do many cases involve failure to give safety net instructions or evidence them? Uh, certainly lots of cases involve allegations of failure to give safety net instructions and if those safety net instructions aren't evidenced then it becomes incredibly difficult to defend a case if that becomes a crucial part of the case so for example um you know counseling a patient about red flag symptoms uh where they've got something that doesn't fit quadraquina diagnosis but it's a problem that could in unusual circumstances progress to quadraquina uh, syndrome so if you don't document that you've given the sort of red flag advice about symptoms where they should be you know taking themselves off to uh, a and e that is a very common cause of claims where people you know have um lower back pain uh, and the expert says, well, you know, I don't think they should have diagnosed quadraquina at this stage. I don't think they should have booked the patient for an urgent scan at this stage. But what I do think they should have been done, been told is um, symptoms to be aware of and symptoms that would need urgent action if these do arrive. Uh, and if those aren't documented, that case is a settler. Thanks, Chris. Um, next question. Do healthcare professionals include non-clinicians, um, for example, a receptionist, other admin staff as part of redaction? Uh, no, I mean, it's not often that you would get um, the names of healthcare staff. I, I take a pragmatic approach. Um, NHS has got the My Name Is campaign. Uh, and for anything where if a you know if people if claimant solicitors for example are asking you know oh what was the experience of this individual surgeon who did this procedure um, before one gets into sort of debating well you know well this is the personal data of the um, the surgeon concerned you know would have to consult with them my approach to the trusts in those circumstances okay well if the patient asked about that surgeon's experience as part of the clinical interaction you know the pre-operative counseling what would you say because that's a perfectly legitimate question for a patient to ask uh, you certainly wouldn't give the patient the surgeon's cv in response to that question but you would tell them something so it's ask yourself what what would we say in those circumstances Thank you, Chris. Um, next question. We seem to have diff difficulty with clinicians understanding the term serious harm when seeking their authorization for disclosure. The ICO slash BMA guidance is quite subjective on the matter. What is your definition of serious harm? Oh, this is an interesting one. So um, this is in the context of withholding information from the patient on the basis that disclosure is likely to cause um serious harm um i mean i i think the question there comes back to um in you know what what is the likely outcome of disclosure going to be so at one end of the spectrum um i have in the past heard people argue that um, cancer patients shouldn't be told their prognosis because it will do them harm. Um, and that's, 
that's not something you can use a blanket approach to. There's, there's a whole whole load of sensitive interactions as to how information about prognosis, what the patient is interested in hearing, how it should be conveyed. It's 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 not a uh, I don't need to do this because it would cause some serious harm uh, decision. I I think it's highly context sensitive. It's very much the, the same um, approach as when the police are asking you to breach confidence in the public interest. I can certainly see the argument, for example, that um, if you disclose, um, for example, the person, the identity of the person that uh, made the allegation that sort of prompted a safeguarding investigation and the, pa the patient or family member affected is up in arms, you know, I need to know who, who said this, this is entirely malicious. I can, there would be serious harm, I think, to the wider patient base in need of safeguarding if uh, the identity of informants was disclosed. So that's one context where serious harm is not just looking at the harm to that patient. Uh, certainly it doesn't mean that the patient may be mildly upset about it, but Again, it often crops up in mental health cases, and there was uh, there was once a really unusual case where um, a psychiatric patient wanted access to their records, and the serious harm exemption was applied, and the patient challenged that in court. And what the court actually did, because this was this was outside the scope of the mental health rules where a patient's representative can be given information and confidence that isn't shared with the patient. So the patient's representative would have been obliged to share information with the patient. So the court appointed a uh, an independent lawyer to review the records and make submissions in the patient's absence on the question of serious harm. And the court actually upheld the decision not to disclose information uh, because it would be likely to cause serious harm if disclosed. Uh, it's, I think it's very, very hard to define what serious harm is. I think you recognise it when you see it. It's very context dependent and I would definitely urge you to adopt a critical eye when somebody is alleging serious harm. Um, because um, it, it's not, uh, oh, this is an easy get out clause to me because I don't want to disclose this to the patient. Um, I would certainly say it has to be evidence based. Uh, and so the arguments for and against harm and the assessment of whether it, um, the responsible clinician is satisfied that the serious harm test is met that that should be properly documented it shouldn't just be uh, oh i believe that this will cause serious harm i think you should be documenting why this will cause serious harm uh, what the concern is why there is no way of um mitigating that harm while still allowing um the disclosure to take place but I, I'm, I'm sorry i can't I can't give you an easy definition. <laughs> the abstract is what amounts to serious harm, but um, it, it, it's a legitimate exemption, but it does need to be considered carefully. And I would strongly recommend having a properly uh, auditable thought process before relying on the serious harm exemption. Thanks, Chris. Um, next question. If the family of deceased indicate litigation and request records, but aren't executor slash administrator, what rights, what rights do they have? Right. In those circumstances, um, you need to do a bit of digging to find out whether they in fact have a claim. 
or are likely to have a claim or are within the pool of people that could bring a claim. Uh, I think it is, I mean, there's, when somebody dies, the uh, claims will normally fall into one of two categories. There will be the claim on the behalf of the estate of the deceased for the harm the deceased patient suffered before they died. And that claim can only be brought by the personal representative, the executor, the administrator of the deceased. Um, the other classes of claim are dependent upon the relationship between the proposed claimant and uh, the deceased. So, for example, um, somebody that is challenging a will on the basis that the patient lacked capacity at the time the will was drawn up. Um, that is a claim arising out of the death of the deceased. And in those circumstances, um, you may disclose the information relevant to the question of capacity. Uh, in other circumstances, um, people can bring a claim because they were financially dependent upon the deceased, in which case um, you would disclose the information relevant to that claim, subject, of course, to the provisos in the Access to Health Records Act, where, uh, in essence, uh, you can't disclose information that the patient would not have wanted disclosing to those individuals. And if you're in that situation, um, the applicant party is going to need to get a court order for release of those documents. I mean, sometimes it will happen. Uh, and there's been, in fact, the um, case, the first case law that actually established as a rule of law that the obligation of confidentiality uh, endures beyond death was somebody uh, that was not happy about the patient's treatment, but was not the uh, personal representative of the deceased, and nor were they financially dependent upon the deceased. So they had no uh, avenue uh, to gain access to those records, and they ended up bringing a high court claim uh, challenging um, and the avenue they went for was they sought the records under the Freedom of Information Act and normally you would never be disclosing records under the Freedom of Information Act because there is a uh, steaming great exemption for its personal data but of course by the quirk of legislation um, the GDPR or the Old Data Protection Act, Current Data Protection Act, don't apply to records of deceased people. So the claim was brought on the basis that this information um, is not personal data, and they claimed that the obligation of confidentiality only endured during the patient's lifetime. And once they were dead, the obligation of confidentiality fell away. And Despite the fact that, you know, anybody working in the health sector, as you said, does the obligation of confidentiality um, endure beyond death? They would immediately say yes. There had, in fact, been no decided case on that point until this one. So sometimes there will be people that are after the records that, of a deceased patient that aren't entitled to them, which is why if somebody's going for the well, I'm not the personal representative of the deceased. I don't have the consent of the personal representative of the deceased, which would be the other way. Uh, but I'm asserting I have a, a, a claim arising out of the death of the deceased. Therefore, I'm entitled to see those records. You do need to do your due diligence as to the nature and extent of that claim and to make sure that they actually do have a legitimate claim and they're not just using it as a fig leaf to gain access to stuff they wouldn't yeah. otherwise have a route to. The only other point to add to that, and I had this some time ago in, in claimant practice, under the Fatal Accidents Act, if a financial dependent of the deceased has a claim for loss of that financial dependency and they're not the executor, they don't 
had to go into probate and so on. I think after, I think if the executor or the administrator, they say, hasn't brought an action, I think it's within six months of the death, then the financial dependent can bring the claim themselves once that six months has passed under the Fatal Accidents Act. I mean, let's say, let's say you have a family dynamic where you have a spouse who is the administrator of the estate, decides for whatever reason they're not going to make a claim. And then you have, um, say, a, a child living at home who says, actually, I think I will make a claim because, you know, they paid all the bills. Um, so I'm going to make a claim um, as a financial dependent. I think after after six months has passed, they then can bring that claim in their own right. Um, and at that point, I would suspect they will then be entitled to the records. Um, I was trying to find the section of the Act where Chris was being. It's yeah, section section two of the Fatal Accidents Act. Um, so any any action brought under the Fatal Accidents Act brought by the executor of the administrator of the deceased, um, but if no action is brought within six months after the death by the executor or administrator of the deceased, um, the action can be brought by any of the persons whose benefit an executor or administrator could have brought it. And that, so that will include, as I say, anybody who has a financial dependency claim um, arising out of the death. Um, Thank you both. Um, yeah. Just to find, sorry, Martin, sorry. No, that's fine. Uh, um, just a final question. Um, when would it, when would it or or would it not be acceptable to, to disclose complaint incident files, including serious incident reports to solicitors in the event of a claim? Should these automatically be brought to coroner's attention in the event of an inquest? I, well, I would certainly say you are treading an extremely high risk path if you don't alert the coroner to the fact that there's been a complaint or a serious untoward incident um, because even if the uh, serious untoward incident investigation is incomplete the coroner will still want to see what material has been generated uh, in respect of that often if you're in the case in case of doubt as to whether you should be sharing the information with the coroner or not uh, a, a simple way of clearing that up is just telling the coroner, oh, here are the records, and by the way, there's a live complaint involving this um, patient, and there's been an SUI investigation. Do you need, to, do you wish to see the papers in relation to that? In which case, the coroner will almost inevitably uh, reply with a very prompt yes, send them to me. So, it's uh, the question of SUI investigations and uh, complaints is more complicated in a civil procedure setting. Um, but if the trust is clearly going to be the intended defendant in the case, um, my general approach, if there's clearly relevant material, um, to that civil claim. Um, I mean, norma normally the claimant solicitors will ask for, <coughs> excuse me, complaints, investigations, forms and what have you. Um, even if they request that information under the GDPR to avoid paying a fee for access, my approach would be make the disclosure, but make it plain that you're providing it by way of voluntary pre-action disclosure, because in that way, that stops what you've disclosed being splashed across the Daily Mail, because the solicitors are going to use it for free marketing material. I mean, it doesn't, doesn't mean to say that that's not going to happen five years down the line if there happens to be the material is entered open court, but um, you get better protection for uh, the organisation and for the staff mentioned in the investigation file, in the SUI file. They get, get much better protection for their data if you make a voluntary pre-action disclosure of you're likely to be the defendant. And if you're not likely to be the defendant, it's extremely unlikely that complaints or um, 
SUI files will exist um, or be sought. Thank you, Chris. Um, I believe that's all the questions. Um, as I see, we're, we've we overrun a little bit. Um, we'll probably just um, end the session there, but it's just to the, thank everyone who's um, who attended this morning and thank you very much for your questions. If you do have any more questions, um, you will receive a copy of the slides and they have um, Chris and Martin's details on there so you can email them if anything comes to mind later. Um, as I say, yes, you'll, you'll all get a copy of the slides and um, a link to the uh, recording in due course. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.